works, that's a great thing because business online becomes possible. When it doesn't work, of course, there are enormous problems. And so for the last 20, 20 years, we've also looked at the challenges to online privacy and security and pointing to the risk that the NSA created when in effect it said we don't necessarily want people to have secure online communications because if they have secure online communications it's possible that ability might be misused. It could be used in ways that pose risks to public safety and I wouldn't dispute that of course. But in a decision about technical standards for the internet that diminishes the privacy that users might otherwise be entitled to, there is also a substantial risk. And that is that the cyber attacks that we're experiencing today from foreign adversaries and you know, criminal hackers and others result in part from the decisions that have been made to diminish the level of privacy and security that would otherwise be available. So we see this in a very um, big picture um, about how safe the internet is to use when uh, people go online. It's also a fascinating uh, question from a legal or regulatory perspective. There is right now between the United States and the European Union a very big debate over whether companies, internet companies based in the United States provide adequate privacy protection for EU consumers who go to these internet companies and provide their personal information. And part of what's going on here is a contrast between two legal systems. European Union said more than 20 years ago, we want a comprehensive approach to privacy protection. Privacy is very important. Of course, we support commerce and freedom of expression, but we will establish a comprehensive approach. And any business that collects and uses uh, personal data is going to be subject to that approach. That's the baseline in the European Union. The U.S. has taken a somewhat different approach. Uh, we had a moment, let's say about 40 years ago, where we decided to put in place a comprehensive approach for the federal government. We called that the Privacy Act, but we chose not to do it for the private sector. We sort of went sector by sector. You have privacy protection, for example, for your cable subscriber records, but not your magazine subscription records. And then as we entered the Internet age, we said, well, we're not even sure that we actually need law because people can make choices. They'll have all these different options available to them. If they don't like you know, Google, they can use another search company. Or if they don't like Facebook, they can use another social media company. And essentially made the decision not to put in place comprehensive privacy law. And as a consequence, of course, there's very little privacy protection for Internet users today for US-based services. Europeans are saying increasingly, we're not happy about that arrangement. And we think the US will need uh, to do more. So, and finally, just to get to the third part of the book, as I said, we talk a bit about the history of the organization, our litigation strategies and advocacy strategies. Our, we actually did the first internet petition more than 20 years ago. I'm proud of that. It was to oppose the NSA's encryption scheme. Uh, we got 50,000 people to, to sign up. I mean, now that's like a, a chat room or something. But, you know, 20 years ago, it felt like half the internet. Um, so we did the first internet petition. We brought lots of uh, cases and open government cases and so forth. But the last part of the book tries to set out concrete uh, recommendations because it is very much my view that these are problems that we need to find solutions for, which is not the same thing as saying these are problems that can be solved. Anyone who's worked in the realm of environmental protection, for example, if someone walked in and said, I figured out how to solve air pollution or figured out how to solve water pollution. You probably wouldn't take that comment very seriously because I don't think in our modern industrial <laughs> economy we solve those problems. But I think we find ways to manage those problems. And so we've taken a similar approach with privacy protection. We've said how do we get the advantages of the new technologies while minimizing the privacy risk. Coming back to Jim's example, you know, I don't think internet users should spend their evenings trying to figure out who's collecting data about them or changing their privacy settings or restoring their opt-in or anything like that. I think the service should simply be designed to provide a high level of privacy to the individual and if the individual chooses to disclose information to third parties, that should be their choice. I mean, no one is ever denied the opportunity to exchange their data to others. What we're objecting to is the current default setting, which basically says that companies can take your information unless you object. 
Now that seems entirely unfair. It's a bit like you know, an auto manufacturer saying, well, you know, we've got safety features on this car, things like seat belts and turn indicators and stuff like that and brake pads for your tires and so forth. They're all sitting in the trunk and if you want to take advantage of any of them, you know, there's an instruction manual and you can figure out how to install that stuff and you might find it useful. But isn't it really fun to drive a car? I mean, isn't that where we are today with the internet? Isn't it really kind of fun to use the internet? Yeah, there's some, some privacy stuff somewhere and some manuals and stuff and if you have the time you know good luck with it but that's entirely upside down I think we need to think about internet privacy and the protection of privacy that that's the default let's establish safeguards leave people with the freedom and the choice to disclose their personal data as they choose thank you um, I'd like to turn a little bit towards surveillance um, some people talk about that there was a uh, the world changed after 9-11 and um, we find that many cities have put up cameras today. In Boston, for instance, uh, the, the, um, the conviction of the, of, of, um, uh, the bomber in, for, for the uh, marathon uh, was largely attributed to some of the images that were obtained. More cameras went up for the marathon. We hear that uh, you know, individuals are being tracked to and from Syria for ISIS. Uh, we also have seen, if anybody's traveled up and back on Route 95, there's a balloon type thing that is hovering over Aberdeen, I believe it is. So, uh, Professor, if you have an opportunity here, uh, would you please talk a little bit about, are we, are we in a new normal? Well, <clears throat> thank you, especially by closing your question by Mentioned the name of a book. <laughs> My <laughs> pleasure. Uh, very nicely you shoot it in there. <laughs> so I will talk about the new normal, but I need to step back just for one minute so I, I can uh, justify uh, uh, what I'm going to suggest. And uh, my concern is, once you hear all this very concerning, uh, al somewhat alarming uh, statement on my left and on my right, or on my right and my left, is, uh, it, how are we going to think about them? And my argument is that we tend to think about them like lawyers, and we should think about them like human beings. And what I mean by this is like this. We have in our courts a system which I would call extreme advocacy. It means that one side comes and says that the defendant is the most awful human being who ever existed. He uh, pulls the hair out of cats, he tortures children, and the other side says, he's a lovely kid, he, he gives milk to the kiddies, he takes care of his mother. And both sides, out of that clash of two extreme positions, justice is supposed to arise. And by the way, in our court system, the jury and the judge are not allowed to ask any questions. It's what the two sides bring to the table, that's it. Uh, be applying now that to policy making. That's what's called polarization. So one side says, Divided my privacy, nothing is left. I can go to the bathroom without NSA taking my picture. And the other side says, uh, uh, we need it to stop terrorists, which have uh, under every bed there's one with a nuclear weapon and such. And out of the clash of two extreme presentation like this, somehow wisdom and realistic policy is supposed to arise. I suggest instead a, a dialogue, a dialogue we start with the assumption that we face conflicting major challenges. Life is complicated, I'm sorry. So on the one hand, we have indeed individual rights, which is, makes this country great, which is our greatest contribution to humanity, and they must be protected in any way we know how. On the other hand, we have public goods, security, public health and such, which we also need to be concerned with. And it's true that some people exaggerate the threat to our security. Some people may exaggerate a little how much little privacy we have been left. But I'm not interested in this uh, exaggeration. I'm interested in the question that the dialogue has to start by saying we have two legitimate claims here. And not simply let's yield to one side or the other. The next step, ladies and gentlemen, is to read the Constitution. 
because keep telling us that's where the Bill of Rights comes from. But the, the Fourth Amendment, which is the most relevant here, doesn't say there be no search and seizure. Unlike the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law, the Fourth Amendment, on the face of it, is dialogic because it says there be no unreasonable searches which means on the face of it, there are reasonable search in the Constitution. So those who run around and wrap themselves in the Constitution uh, should please read one more time the Fourth Amendment. So then we come to the question, the very reasonable question, when are searches reasonable and when they are unreasonable? And we have mechanisms for that, courts and such. So now I'll go back and finally get to your question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, surveillance. Well, uh, Surely nobody wants to be surveilled, but I think I want to surveil some other people. So, uh, uh, yes, we have now a situation where there are 4,000 people who went to fight with ISIS, who have been trained to commit some of the most barbaric acts of terrorism. And they, these 4,000 are from countries which can enter the United States without minimal screening, without visas, because they come from Britain and France, it is. I think it's reasonable to want us to know something about them once they come in the United States. I don't want to quarantine them. I don't want to jail them. I certainly don't want, by not being able to surveil them, have to send 60 FBI agents to go after them day and night. But I'd like to know, after they're back home, maybe for the first six months, whom they called in Pakistan. What message are they getting? Uh, I, we, we can, you may say, no, this case is wrong. But the, the, I want to go to the profound question. Do you agree that there are sometimes situations? People come back from Ebola. They have a temperature. Is it okay for us to ask, have you been to West Africa? Is it okay for us people who ha came back from a, a serving in a hospital, and surely we should cherish and appreciate them. They will stay home for 21 days, so they will not spread Ebola. On all these questions, we, I can argue both sides. My book does exactly that. I take one by one these issues and ask, where should we tilt? But I don't accept the notion that we say, a priori, my problem is violation of privacy. All the rest has to Yield. And let me close by what in some way is the most challenging, and I admit you, my most challenging chapter, and that concerns the freedom of the press. Because you have the following interesting situation that uh, our newspapers mm -hmm. decided that the editors are going to be the ultimate judges what national secrets can be kept secret and which they will publish. So you, a phrase which keeps coming up in the literature I read on the subject, they say the White House pleaded today with the New York Post not to publish the name of the head of the CIA station in Athens. The White House pleaded, pleaded, to, listen, the White House pleaded with a newspaper. Yeah, the White House pleaded not to, con to reveal that there was torture going on, too. I, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I, I know it's, I'm, I'm tough on you. No. I, I, I'm sorry. Not I, I, I'm telling truth, though. Me, too. Uh, well, then let's be, I mean, no question about that. <laughs> that's the whole point. There are two truths, not one. Right. And that's the question. I hope you like what Well, the newspapers decided, to give one example, during World War II, to start earlier, there are much more recent examples that um, the uh, Japanese were dropping depth charges against our submarines. But they were setting them too shallow. 